Vader, ons dankie vir dit wat u en Gerhou sy leven gedoen het, Heere. Ons dankie vir sy hart, Heere, om u te ken en u te dien, om u te volg, Vader. En Heere, ons bid sommer net vir oogend, Heere, soos wat hy vir oogend met ons deel uit sy leven uit, uit dit wat u en sy leven gedoen het, Heere, wil ons vraag dat u gees om sal kom lei, Heere, dat soos wat hy ons bedien, Heere, hy vir oogend sal ervaar hoe u hom bedien, Heere. En ons spreek sommer net sien oor die oomlik. Vader, mag u hom sien, mag u sy vrou en sy gesin sien, Heere. En Vader, ons kom vraag, Heere, dat u en die oomlikke ons harte net weer bewust sal kom ook, van hoe goed en hoe groot u is, in Jesus naam. Amen. 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 Right, Gerre, floor is yours. Dankie. Um, kan ek ook hier onderstaan, soos jy, of moet ek al boe, daar, daar boe staan. Ok, so, dankie, um, dat jy my genooi het, en dankie dat jylle my in jylle huis het vandag. Um, so, ek gaan net een bykie praat oor waar ek vandaan kom, um, and, uh, and the main thing is the outworking of biblical love and obedience wh- when you actually put it into practice. So, uh, my name is Garo, I come from Perro, oorspronkelijk, um, and I was one of the kinders that op a very young age had everything to know, as um, most teenagers are. So, I had a very young or young so van die spore van die lewe afgegaan, goeie christelike huis, groot geword, ma en pa, kerk te gebring, jeug gedoen, al die, al die goed. Um, maar ek het teen die ouderdom van graad 7, was ek al so ver van die spoor af, dat ek in graad 7 my eerste, I, I had my first, sorry, I'm going to jump to English, I had my first run in with police in grade 7. Um, for numerous things from theft to vandalism to mugging someone um, and that was at the age of 12. From there life got systematically worse or better for me. Um, By the end of grade 8 I was an alcoholic. By the end of grade 7 or by halfway through grade 7 I was an alcoholic to the point where every day after school we would go to the then 7-Eleven and you'd get this stuff called crackling wine. It's like cheap man champagne. And we'd buy about three or four bottles each as 13-year-old kids just to get through the afternoon so we could sleep at night. By grade 10, I was a drug addict because alcohol doesn't sustain you for too long. Um, And by grade 11... We were addicted to, so heroin became our drug of choice, and we were addicted to the point where we actually had dealers that were like Mr. Delivery, that we would phone and they would come break times when everyone else is smoking behind the shooting range. We would go to the gate, meet our dealers, score at school, and then go to the school bathrooms and smoke crack and shoot heroin. That was sort of our reality, because otherwise we'd start getting withdrawals by 11 o'clock in the morning, and it would become very apparent to everyone (laughs) what we were doing. Um, Obviously, being a child in school, you don't have a job, so you don't have the finance to support a habit that's costing you about a thousand rand a day. And you start finding other entrepreneurial ways of generating the finance. So... By grade nine, grade 11, the end of grade 11, myself and my group of friends, we were career criminals that just used to come to school to pass the time. And it also makes it look a lot easier when you walk into a place to do something no one suspects a child in uniform. You know, you can literally walk into places and empty a safe and walk out and nobody even looks at you. So, grade 11... Police came, raided our school, I got caught with heroin and Dacha at school, ended up getting suspended, did grade 11 over again, um, and then got into a fight at school and got expelled from school. So I never got to finish my trick, but they let me write my grade 11 exams. Leaving school from there, my parents were trying to get me back on the right track, but you know, if you as a 17, 18 year old child are earning more by working two hours a day in the underworld than your parents are by working eight hours a day at their job, there's sort of no real reason I could see to do what they were asking me to do. And 
life just got, for a while, much better. Um, you know, paying my own way, we were living it up, we were flying where we want, we were using what we want, everyone was young and pretty and strong and, you know, like, like invincible, like we all were, and eventually life got very, very unmanageable. And I um, started being caught for things, started getting arrested, started going to jail. Um, eventually, I'd burnt bridges with everyone that had known me, and no one was prepared to have me even sleep over at their house anymore. So what that meant in my world was that I eventually ended up becoming a homeless person because nobody, you know, my, my parents turned around to me at a stage when I phoned them and they said to me, because I'd, I'd been to jail a few times by then, and they said to me, if the police phone us again, it must be to tell us that you're dead, not that you need bail money, because we refuse to be, like it would be better for us if you weren't alive than what you're putting us through at the moment. So I spent about six years on the street um, and eventually sleeping in that little tunnel with another guy. Um, and that was living it up as far as homeless people are concerned. Like that was, you know, you had walls and, and, and somewhere to actually put something soft where for the average homeless person, like when it rains, you go empty these blue bags out of a bin so that you've got something to try and keep dry during the night. Like you can't explain to people how stark the reality of street life is because it's really really hard and you are literally on the bottom rung of society like everybody tends to look down on homeless people and homeless people have no you know we've i've been stabbed a few times and when you get stabbed you can't even go to you don't even have the right to go to the police to make a case because the first thing they ask you is okay if we find the guy how do we contact you and you're like you don't have an address or a cell phone so okay well then we can't take your case so you literally are at the point in life where there is no justice for you, nobody cares about you, and you become sort of a burden to society. Um, but still, criminal, using drugs, living my hashtag best life. Um, so no real, no real want to change. But luckily, because I'd had a good foundational upbringing, I knew who God was. So then, you know, that was my reality, like I said, for about eight years, um, living on the street in that tunnel for the last two with another guy. Uh, I'd met a lady, because um, homeless people fall in love too, I suppose. Um, and she ended up getting pregnant. And um, we didn't want our child born a heroin addict because wouldn't be, wouldn't be the best idea. So we had an amazing idea. And that idea was we knew this couple who the guy was already, they were very old, the guy was already in bed, confined to bed most of the time, and the lady wasn't far behind him. So we had this amazing idea where we would gain entry to their house. And I used to, because the streets are dangerous, believe it or not, um, and I used to walk around with a panga. And we said that what we're going to do is we're going to wait for this lady down the passage. And then when she comes on down the passage, we're going to, there's children here, so we're going to tickle them with a panga. And then we are going to go to the bedroom, do the same to the husband. We would then sell everything in their house, get in their car, drive to a little town, buy medication to come right and start a new life a foolproof plan that would be amazing. Luckily, um, because we'd been at this for so long, people saw us entering their house and phoned the police because they knew that we were wanted by the police for other things because we were involved in certain other things. And here I am standing in the passage behind this lady and I'm like waiting for her to come down the passage and she starts coming down and I'm winding up and there's a knock on the door. And she turns around and walks and opens the door and it's the police. And they say, yeah, they've heard 
there's people that are looking for you, can they come in? Obviously, she had no reason not to let them in, so they came in. I hid the panga under the washing machine that was in her laundry at the back, and they ended up finding us in her house. When they arrested us, the thing that surprised me the most was that as they wanted to take us out, the lady stopped them, and she said to them, shame, look how these children look. Can they at least eat before they go? And somehow the police said yes. And it was like one of the most surreal moments I've had where they took off our handcuffs and the two of us and the two police detectives and this lady sat and had breakfast at her table. And it's like I couldn't understand it because we were just going to tickle you and now you're inviting me to breakfast. But we had a very nice breakfast, um, and afterwards, I'd love to say she prayed for us, but all she did was she looked at us and she said to us that, like, hey, God loves you, and I really hope that at some point you meet him and things change for you guys. And that was sort of my first encounter with someone that sort of showed me love without actually having to, and where they actually had every reason to do the opposite. From there, we obviously went to jail, um, and in jail, we thought that, um, you know, this was going to be what was going to happen. My child was going to be born in jail. The state would take them. Um, and so I made a deal with God, and I was like, listen, God, if you, if, if you can let us get out, if we can, like, somehow get around this, then I'm going to serve you to the best of the ability in the situation I'm in. So, like, I'm still a drug addict, I'll still have to do drugs, but I'll become one of those oaks that stand at the robot with a board and, like, just, or, and, or, you know, bother you in the parking lot and tell you, like, I need money for petrol or something. Um, but I won't break into houses, I won't mug people, I won't, you know, steal. I like do, I'll stop hurting other people and only have myself, and then, like, I'm trusting that you will come through and do something for me. So we got out of jail after two months, um, and then I did what I said to God I would do, because I have to be obedient to the promises I make. And that went on for two years. And after two years, I was standing hitchhiking one day to go stand at a robot with a board, and this guy picked me up. And he, he still said to me, he was like, yes, dude, you look very dodgy but God told me to pick you up. And he actually told me last time already, but I didn't listen last time, and when he told me this time, like I've learned I need to listen, or he's, he's just gonna tell me louder. So he, he picked me up, and he ended up taking me for coffee, and we had an, an, an open, honest discussion, and he said to me, what do you want? Do you want money or do you want help? And he sort of offered me the two. And I was like, no, 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 dude, I really, really, like, I need help. So this guy did some crowdfunding on Facebook, and he managed to send me to a restoration center, which is almost like a rehab, but they focus on the spirit and trust the body to come right instead of focusing on the body and then expecting the spirit to come in line because it just doesn't work that way around. So that man that you see there was a guy that was living on the street with me, he was my, uh, my tunnel mate. It's almost like a flatmate, but in a tunnel. Um, and this guy actually ended up, um, there's another photo where he is on, it's also of us, there we go. So the guy in the middle was the one that actually ended up picking us up, up, up off the street and listening to God, and this is a month in from where the other photo was taken. So you can see the hair's a bit shorter, the skin's a bit less burnt, um, and the clothes are a bit cleaner. But once again, yeah, this was a nice, it's not that it's a nice example, but it sort of shows you about when it comes to obedience and about what you choose to do with what God's giving you, how that can end up looking very differently for different people. So... Myself, I decided to be obedient and listen to the council of elders, like what's you know, written in this book. Um, and I stuck it out in 
that place for nine months before I ended up leaving. My buddy Bruce stayed there for a month. And a couple of days after this photo was taken, he said he was standing in the bush and the wind was blowing and it was like God was telling him, you healed and it's time to go. And we said to him, no, dude. Like, you know, like that. I know your heart is telling you like you want to, you know, like you're fine and you're, and you're but like the Bible says, beware your heart. Like guard your heart because from it the issues of life run. Like it's written there for a reason. But like we don't have the authority to keep you there if you're not willing to submit yourself. Long story short, Bruce left on the Friday and Two days later, on Sunday evening, we got a call that he had died in the police holding cells in Belleville. You know, if that man had submitted, ah, today, um, we're going to get there, but I'm 10 years later standing here. I've got a wife, I've got three kids, like I'm, you know, but it's taken a lot of obedience and a lot of submission and a lot of, like, really seeking God but by also getting confirmation of people around me. And I know for a fact, because God told me very clearly, like I was drinking water from a tap, and God said to me, if you leave and return to your vomit, you will die there. And I was like, okay, cool. And I think that's why, because I, I do sort of like life. Um, but, you know, I often wonder, Bruce had a family that he hadn't seen for about seven years at this stage. Um, they actually moved to another country to get away from him because, you know, criminals from the street were not nice. Um, and he'd written a letter to his son in New Zealand. And the Sunday night we heard that he was dead and the Monday his son phoned from New Zealand looking for him. And like I often wondered, like, if he'd just been that little bit more obedient, if he just like stuck it out that two more days, like how differently his life might have looked now as well. You know, and yeah, you know, it's not that if you're obedient, you're going to get everything you want, but if you're obedient, there's life to be found in it. And that's like the one thing I found over and over is that when I'm obedient to what the Bible tells me, like it sort of takes my emotion out and then it puts everything in God's hands and it just works out so nicely. So, in any case, Bruce died, I stayed. Moved on nine months later, left the farm, um, and then I had an, was looking for work. But, you know, gap in the CV, so finding work is a bit difficult when you haven't really got anything to put on your CV for the last 15 years. And somehow I ended up getting an interview that Nihilus also three people organized for me. Um, but I ended up getting an interview for a job to go work overseas. Uh, in the, to actually be contracted out to Abu Dhabi's government as like anti-piracy security because everyone wants a homeless criminal to do security internationally. <laughs> um, and, you know, as you guys might remember, I've got a criminal history going to any, like if you go to the police station, they've got these little DOS screens that it comes up on the new government hasn't afforded windows yet. So, you know, and I had like four screens like that of cases, pending cases, cases that were on my screens. It was like, because it spanned 20 years. And I said to this guy, I'm like, there's no way. Like, I, you know, I've always wanted to go overseas, but there's no way it's going to happen, because if you've got a criminal record, you're done. So I spoke to my mentor, and I said to him, what, what do I do? Do I just, like, lie to these people, tell them I've been an entrepreneur, because I look decent now? Do I tell them I've been an entrepreneur for the last 20 years? Do I tell them, like, I've decided to, like, you know, what do I do? So he's like, what does the Bible tell you to do? And I said to him, no, the Bible says I must operate in truth. So he says, well, then, you operate in truth. I was like, okay, fine. I didn't like it, but, you know, authority, submission, obedience. So I went for this interview, which was quite a big thing, and part of it is like a polygraph where... One of the questions is, do you have a criminal record? And I did answer yes. And then I went for the interview of the people from the company. And I ended up telling this guy my whole... Oh, but then what happened was the guy that was supposed to interview me got sick. 
and he didn't pitch up the day. So the owner of the company ended up interviewing me. And I ended up being honest with him. I said to him, listen, this is where I've come from, this is where I'm at, and this is what I'm hoping for my future. And he turned around and he said to me, you know what, his son used to struggle with addiction. And they had the money to fix it early on. So he's not going to judge me for the same thing that his son went through. Let's put in my papers and see what happens. So we send in my papers to Pretoria, where they do the criminal check and everything, with my polygraph report, where I answered, yes, I have a criminal record. A month later, a month and a half later, papers come back from Pretoria, clean criminal record. And I, yeah, my reaction exactly, thank you. So I went to my mentor and I was like, Johnny, like this, this doesn't make sense, bro. So he's like, yeah, 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 but, you know, the Bible does say that love holds no record of wrong, and because of your obedience, God's love has just wiped out your record of wrong. And I was just like, huh? But then, yeah, okay. So I ended up going overseas, and that's sort of one of the times where uh, it, it just got put to me again, like, if you're just obedient and you trust God with the outcome, like, if you're just obedient, like, even if that had come back that, I had a criminal record and I didn't get the job. Just having that trust in God that he's got something else lined up for me or that he wants to use me somewhere else, you know? So anyway, I went overseas, did the anti-piracy thing, became a team leader of an anti-piracy unit for the next two years. And then I decided I'm getting old and I want to like, start building a life. So came back to Cape Town, had some money saved up, uh, decided part of building a life is getting a family, so I need to get a wife. So like any normal person does, I signed up for Tinder. <laughs> um, and I spoke to God about this, don't worry. God said it's fine. Um, but he did to give me, he said to me, when you, when you go on your first date, what you must do is you must tell them the three worst things about you on your first date in the first five minutes. And then their reaction from there. So I was like, cool. So I went on two different dates with two different women, and both of them, first five minutes, coffee just, because I don't drink, um, coffee just, and I said, you know, homeless, drug addict, been to jail, now I'm saved, what do you think? <laughs> and the, 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 the weird part to me where I realized another thing in life is both those women turned around, one a bit more aggressively than the other, but both those women turned around and their only question to me was, so does, children, does that mean no jumping castle before marriage? And I was like, yeah, 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 we, we won't be jumping on any castles before marriage. Um, <laughs> and, and then the one still said to me, she's like, is that like serious or like just what you tell people but actually you do something? So, so I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's serious. That's just sort of, that's what God tells me. So that's what I've got to be obedient to. And both of them turned around and said, well, then this isn't going to work for us. And I was like, okay, cool. This isn't going to work for me either then. And that's when I realized chicks be crazy. That's a thing for a reason, you know? Um... So I, I spoke to God again, and I said to God, listen, I've decided I'll do what Paul said. I'll rather live a celibate life. I'll devote myself to you. Like, if you send me someone along the way, it's great, but I'm, I, I can see what's out there, and I'm, I'm not interested in buying, even if it's on sale. And um, then I got a job at another place, and I started working, and I was serving three different churches and doing everything else. And we had this tea lady that was like a very, she's like, so she's like a pinkster Christian. You know, that, oh, here is a streak, come on, here is blood, and let it come. She's like And we were standing in the kitchen at my work, and this blonde lady, pretty little thing, walks in, and this Johanna stops, and she looks, and she's like, Nee, man, what's verkeerd met jylle? Jy is a young Christian, jy is a young Christian, jy moet haar vir koffie vat en dan wil ek by die trouwe wees. <laughs> and I was like, sure, like we haven't even, like I don't even know her name and you're inviting yourself to the wedding. 
Um, then I made a terrible attempt at flirting, but my wife thought it, well, my, then this girl thought it was cute. Um, and we started doing some coffees and stuff. We actually had our first date at a church. We ended up getting engaged at a church. And a year later, we were married, and Joanna was at the wedding, you know. <laughs> Um, and yes, a year is a quick time, but you know, when I asked my wife to marry me, um, she had a momentary lapse of good judgment, and she said yes. So I thought, <laughs> before she changes her mind, let me just solidify it. Um, and then we started doing Bible study together. We only read up to Genesis 2, so we just kept making children and children, which is why we've got three now. Um, but now there's my wife. Um, everything I never knew I always wanted and my three little kids. Uh, they don't really need to wear glasses, they just do because it helps them see their future more brightly. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's that. So, you know, once again, I look at what I've got today from being obedient and being obedient in the difficult things and what Bruce could, like he had that and his life ended and he never got to get it back. Today, where my parents said to me, if they get a call, it must be that I'm dead, not that I need bail money, and that I had an interdict against me that I wasn't allowed to even come into the area where they lived. Like today, I house it for them. Like we bry with them, you know, for rugby or whatever else. But like that relationship has been restored, and it wasn't restored like that, but it was restored by the testimony of my life going forward from addiction and how I lived and that I'm living with integrity, and that I'm living in obedience, and that I'm living in love as best as I can. And so my encouragement would be, when you guys are in difficult situations that you don't know what to do, like read what the Bible says and be obedient to that. Like test God on the things that he says. And I promise you, like time and time again, that's an eight-year difference um, in the top I weighed a stunning 52 kilograms when I left street, uh, and I'm now just under 100. So God's made me twice the man I was, almost. Six Ks to go. <laughs> Six Ks to go. But um, that's my wife with two of our kids at the bottom. We've had another one after that. Um, and then because of load shedding, the Wi-Fi was cut so we could read further in the Bible, and we now know that there's other things we need to do in life. <clears throat> but yeah, all of that was just from love and obedience. And, you know, then I was serving at three different churches. Um, I was loving everybody fiercely, you know. I was like, people were saying, I'm like, Bru, I'm going to set myself on fire and tell the sinners to watch me burn because, like, it's going to get attention for the kingdom. But I was never stopping to ask God, how do you want me to love people? And this is, once again, how I know I've got the right wife, is we were driving one day, and we drove past this guy and his girlfriend, I assume it was his girlfriend, pushing their motorbike. And I drove past, and I looked, and I said to my wife, petrol, because they're young, you know, they don't have money. So, drove like 10 k's, bought a can, put in 20 liters of petrol, drove back to them, pull up next to the light here, and I'm like, petrol, Sian. Near where my villa's pop. So, my wife, who was then still my girlfriend, when we left there, she said to me, You see, that's your problem in life. You always see people and you want to help, but you run ahead to help them without stopping to ask what they need. And I think that's, and that hit me quite deep, because at that time I was. Co facilitating hope meetings. We were part of a church plant. I'm serving in three different churches. I'm like flipping, I'm helping everywhere, but I'm not really being effective anywhere because I'm helping where I want to. And then when things aren't working the way I want them to, I get despondent. I'm like, I can't keep helping that guy. Can't keep helping that guy. And then one day God said to me, He was like, Hey, dude, you don't help people because of the results you want to see you help people because of your love for me. Like, that's why you help. You help people without expectation. It's like sort of, you know, when a beaver's building a dam, he puts like one stick, one stick, one stick, and like he's put 50 sticks already, and the dam's not stopping yet because he's 
So that beaver just says, oh, bro, this isn't doing anything. Like, let me just, you know, nothing will ever get built. And just like that, nothing for the kingdom will ever get built if every time we've placed one or two stones and we're not already seeing the results that we want, we just say, like, oh, this is fruitless. I'm throwing poles to pigs. Let me stop. So I had to really go look at myself and look at when I'm helping people, what's the motive of my heart? You know, because if the motive, because like the Bruce, like I can tell you lots of stories of like, I know more people that have died that were friends of mine than I probably have friends that are alive at the moment. That's just like a reality of the life that I've lived. It's sad to me because I've started forgetting people's names, but I still remember their faces. There's just too much. But then I can also tell you so many stories of people that have come from the street and gained freedom of uh, working with a lady now, no lady now, who she used to pawn her baby to the Nigerians when she didn't have money for heroin. Like she would literally go drop her baby off and be like there, give me two bags, I'll come sort it out later. Like, and where she was also homeless and women do other things for money. Um, to the point where, so she lost her children, she lost everything, living on the street, looking rough, to the point where today, she's, she didn't find God, she went back to him, God was never lost. Um, but she's in relationship with God, she's sorted her life out through obedience, and she's actually gotten both her kids back now. Like her family has been restored, and they're living in where they church and fellowship together, as opposed to where she's dropping them off at heroin dealers to get a line of credit, you know? But if I had to have stopped at every story where it's like, oh, this isn't getting the results I want, let me, you know? And we are called to love for no other reason than to love. The Bible just says that, like, with what we were given, we must do what we can, where we can, with what we can. Boop. It's that simple. And we trust God for everything else. And then there's also, like, I've got a very cool, clear understanding of, so, so, so like there's God, Holy Spirit, and Jesus. And God judges, Holy Spirit leads, and Jesus loves. And like, I, I realize that like sometimes we're trying to do all three. Like we're trying to love people by leading them to God. And if we don't get that whole thing right, then we get despondent in what we're doing. And it's like, no, 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 dude, you were called to love called to be like Jesus, like I must leave the leading to the Holy Spirit, I must leave the judgment to God, like all that I must do is love people, and whether I'm the one that's just planting the seed, whether I'm the one that's actually getting to baptize them, whether I'm the, as long as I'm part of that loving process, I'm being obedient to what God's called me to do, you know, because I might speak to you now, and you think like, Christians, and you walk away, you know, in a year's time, Neil speaks to you in another, where's Grainu? You know, um, but, but, but like just part of that process, but sometimes people just need that constant love, that constant love. So, you know, whether you're loving the homeless, whether you're loving your neighbor, whether you're having a difficult person at work that you're just trying to bring some kingdom mindset to, it's like, let's just love and humble ourselves. Because I look, the guy that picked me up from hiking, I still said to him that a while later, I said to him, dude, I was in rehab for like six months. And I said to him, dude, there's one thing I still don't understand. It's like, why did you do all of this? What are you getting out of it? And he's like, no, 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 he's not getting anything out of it. He just, he's called to love me and God's told him, like, he, he gets life with God out of it. And I was like, don't believe that. I don't believe that. But now that I'm in a position where I get to love people just because, like now I understand it. Now I understand what value that adds to my life and how much joy that brings to my life when I get to be part of somebody's story. And it doesn't have to be the main part. Like, you know, I serve a church in, a, in the parking lot. Like I'm, I, I help park cars. Like I don't have to be honest. I, just as long as I get to be part of God's story, man, that's all that I want. And as long as I get to lay my head down at night and be like, Lord, I've done the best I can with what you've given me. And I've done it out of love for you, not out of expectation for myself. 
sort of, I've just seen the fruit of that grow in my life. So yeah, that's my story. Um, it's basically just God redeems, God restores. You know, God is a God of, of endless love and of endless possibility and of endless resource. And, and like if we just test him on his word and live obediently in love to him, the change that he can make, like he can have extraordinary change through ordinary obedience. You know, that guy, he picked up a hitchhiker. It's such a small act of obedience. But because he picked up that hitchhiker today, that hitchhiker is still alive and he's married and he's brought three other lives into this world that would never have been here if that guy hadn't picked up a hitchhiker. So yeah, Father God, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you for how you love us, Father God. I thank you for the plans that you have for us, Father. Father, I just ask that you would open all of our hearts to love those around us, to serve those around us because of the love that we have for you, Father, not because of the things that we want to see to us for ourselves, because it is all about you, Father. Father, I ask that you would soften our hearts as we talk to others and soften others' hearts as we're in service to them, and that through that, Father, and through the leading of your Spirit and the love of your Son, that we may grow the kingdom and see it established here on earth. We love you, we worship you, and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.